Smart speakers help with a lot these days. Did you know you can use your smart speaker to hear the top stories of the day from a Catholic perspective? On Google Home, all you have to do is walk up to your speaker and say, Hey Google, play Catholic news. Here's the latest news. Welcome to your Catholic Daily News Briefing. If you have an Alexa, it's pretty much the same. Just say, Alexa, open Catholic News. Welcome back to the latest news from Catholic News Agency. Go to catholicnewsagency.com slash smart speakers for more information. Maureen Breslin will never forget the day she dropped off her daughter at the front door of the convent. Her daughter felt a calling to religious life, and she was determined to see it through. It was like she took a duffel bag, and I dropped her off, and I didn't know when I was going to see her again. And I was so afraid, because personally, between you and I, I'm a bit of a helicopter mom. I'll admit... I was so afraid of what was going to happen when I let her go and I couldn't, you know, I I didn't have a phone where I could contact her at every minute of the day and say, are you okay? Are you fine? Or, you know, and I thought I would be hysterical crying when I left her. But Maureen didn't cry. That's part of the reason the day is so etched in her memory. Maureen remembers feeling shocked by the sense of peace and joy that washed over her. They were always allowed to call their parents on Sunday. And when she called me that Sunday, I said, I have to ask you something. Are you, do you pray for the parents? Because I can't believe, I just couldn't believe about my reaction to her leaving. It, it, I can't even explain it. I just was, had such a sense of peace and joy. It's hard as a parent because you have to raise these little kids and and then you have to let them go. And um, I think it was shocking to me how easy it was. And I, I just had this sense of calm knowing that he was going to protect her, you know, like I had done my work and now he was going to see that she would do hers, you know. We've shared vocation stories on this podcast in the past, but this week we thought we would talk to the people behind many vocation stories, the parents. To kick off, we have more from Maureen Breslin. Her daughter is the oldest of her two kids, and she's a religious sister with the Servadoras. Her son Matthew was ordained a priest this year. Maureen shares the family story. She'll talk about her children's vocations, and the moments that she believes formed her children to say yes to God's plan for their lives. Then, two of Pat Bridges' children are living out their vocations as Carmelites. He says their vocations weren't a surprise, but it was still bittersweet letting them go. He'll share his story. You're listening to CNA Newsroom, the podcast that brings you the people behind the headlines. I'm your host, Jonah McKeown. Maureen says she is often asked how she did it, how she managed to have both of her children discern and pursue religious vocations. But she says she can't take the credit. It was all God. The Catholic faith has been a part of the Breslin family since the beginning, but Maureen said their observance of the faith was nothing out of the ordinary. They would go to church as a family every Sunday, and her two children went to Catholic school. As a parent, when you send children to Catholic school, it just reinforces your own beliefs. So not only were they living out our faith, you know, at Mass on Sunday, but in school every day. So I think that has a, a lot to do with it, especially in their early years. But beside that, I don't think we were, you know, I, it wasn't like they we were coming home and I was saying, get out your Bibles. And, you know, it wasn't anything like that. I think we had a pretty normal life. But one experience does set the Breslin family apart. When Maureen was pregnant with Matthew, 
Her husband, Alex, was diagnosed with a brain tumor. Her daughter was two at the time. So the day-to-day was really (laughs) day-to-day. You know, I was just trying to get through every single day. And I knew that there was only one person who could help me do that. You know, that's our Lord. You know, that was what I knew. Like, it was so profound that... I needed the strength of God to help me carry out this task. After the diagnosis, the community rallied around the Breslins. Family members, people you don't know that hear about this heartbreaking story and offer goods and services and prayers. And so my children, from the time that Matthew was born and my daughter being two, were thrust into this world of seeing the face of God in the people who came to help us. Alex wasn't expected to live to see Matthew born, but he defied the odds and lived almost 10 years, despite losing much of his hearing and eyesight. Maureen said Alex's fight for his life was an example for her children. He just wanted another day with the kids, another another meal, another ball game, uh, you know, another recital. He just wanted to be there for one more day. And um, I think that had the most profound impact on who they are today. My son often talks about sacrificial love. And um, that's what it was. It was their witness to, you know, people who came to us, to their father, and I guess in part to myself also. You know, a a lot of times I think in this world that we live in today, we don't want our kids, we try to protect our kids, and we don't want them to, you know, be exposed to these heart-wrenching things, but it was that exposure that made them who they are today. Alex died during the night when Matthew was nine and his sister was 11. Maureen told the children the news the next morning. Our whole question was, now what do we do? You know, we, we lived this, with this for almost 10 years. How do we react to this now? And, um, you know, I knew there was only one thing that would be able to fill this void to, you know, bring some kind of light into this darkness that they were thrust into. And um, it was God, you know, it was just... And it wasn't something that I had thought about, or it just came to me, like, you know, um, it's what we had to do. Maureen said the first signs that her children may have vocations emerged around the time of Alex's death. Matthew was a newly minted altar server, and his first request after learning of his father's death was to serve Mass. My son said to me, can we go to Mass this morning because I want to serve at Mass so Daddy can see me serve. Like, he, that was his idea. And then it was something that he wanted to do every way. It was, I think, a way that he felt like he could connect. Maureen's daughter seemed particularly struck by the religious sisters who ran the hospice center where Alex spent his last days. We got in the car one day after visiting my husband, and she said to me, I'm going to do what they do. She was very involved in basketball. She was always tall. She was very athletic. She says, I don't think I'm going to play for the WNBA. I think I want to do what they do. She was so moved by seeing how these women cared. She jumped right into things. Throughout high school, she busied herself with ministry. Once she had the chance, she entered the Servadoras. A few months later, Maureen was at a parish picnic with her son. And there everybody was asking about, how's your daughter? How's she doing? And they kept turning to my son and saying, now you have to become a priest. Now you have to become a priest. And I, I felt like, oh, that's a lot of pressure to put on somebody. Later, she and Matthew got in their car to go home. Matthew turned to her and said, You know what they say in there is true. And I said, what do you mean? <laughs> and he said, I'm going to become a priest. It was the first time Matthew had mentioned the priesthood in years. Maureen was shocked. Matthew was 17 and preparing to start college as a math major. But Matthew said he had been seriously thinking about it for the past two years. I said, well, why didn't you say anything to me? And he said, because I wanted it to be between me and God. And I thought, all right, 
let it be done. You know, like, what better answer could there be than that? He didn't want anyone to influence him one way or the other. He wanted it to be their decision. On May 29th, Maureen sat in a pew in a parish church in the Archdiocese of New York, and she watched as her son was ordained a Catholic priest. Following his ordination, the newly Father Matthew imparted his first blessing on his sister, who today bears the name of Sister Mary, Strength of Martyrs. And now when I look at these kids and I see how profoundly happy they are, I don't know what parent would want anything else for their children you know and it's not about what I want for their life what do they want for their life it's their life it's their life to choose and I'm just I feel so lucky just to be a part of it for Maureen it's still hard to comprehend the fact that both of her children have dedicated their lives to God Like they say, it's not natural. It really is supernatural, you know? And um, I'm just so happy that they had the courage, you know, to say yes when our society is saying the opposite. She has been able to connect with a group of moms of other priests in her archdiocese, and she got to know a lot of other parents when Father Matthew was in seminary. You know, they all felt pretty much the same way. I... I haven't met a parent who said, oh, I can't believe he's doing this. You know, we don't want this. Everybody I've met is, um, like myself, just in awe, in awe of what these young men and women are doing, you know, and carrying on our faith for us. They talk about a vocation crisis. I don't know if it's so much a vocation crisis. I think, you know, as families, are we bringing our kids to church? You know, that it's, it's a crisis within our church where people just aren't going to church. And um, we got to somehow turn that around. So hopefully these kids can do that. Maureen had a constant prayer when her husband Alex was sick. Every day she asked God for the strength to make it through another day. The strength to help her children and her husband make it through another day. When her husband died, her prayer changed. I sat back and thought about their young lives, this 9-year-old and this 11-year-old. And, you know, they were kind of robbed, I felt like, of that childhood joy. You know, as an innocent little kid, how you're running around and playing, and um, their life was different. So my prayer from then on was asking God to give them that joy that I felt like because of the circumstances they were robbed of. And I never could imagine the joy that they have in their lives now. It's something I could have never thought of for my, to teach them to do or to tell them to do. It's just his answer to my prayers. And um, uh, my kids are so incredibly happy. I, um, and I'm so proud of them. People often say to me, oh, you did a good job. And I think, I couldn't do this if I tried. You know, they were young kids. I couldn't get them to make their bed. So it's not like I was going to be able to make them do this. You know, it was it was all part of what was supposed to happen. And somehow they got there. They were open to it, you know, because a, a lot of people aren't open to it. They were open to it. And as their parent, I only wanted to help them be who ever they wanted to be. You know, I only wanted them to support them in any way I could. And um, that was, I think, should be the role of every parent, you know. After the break, Pat Bridges talks about his experiences having two children in religious vocations. Our executive producer, Kate Oliveira, has the story. Stay with us. I'm Kevin Jones, a longtime journalist with Catholic News Agency. 
If you enjoy hearing about the big stories or about the unknown people who played a role in them, you should subscribe to CNA Newsroom. Subscribing is easy and free on any podcast app. Just open whatever podcast app on your phone, type CNA Newsroom into the search bar, and hit the subscribe button. If you don't have a podcast app on your phone already, you can use Stitcher, Spotify, Overcast, or just about any podcast app available on your app store. And if you like listening to CNA Newsroom, leave us a rating and a review. Those help other potential listeners find our show. And now, back to the episode. Once a year, Pat Bridges and his wife pick a date on the calendar for a family reunion. The nine Bridges children are all grown and scattered across the country. We just set a date and say, okay, if you can, if you can come, please come. Pretty routine family reunion business. Except the annual reunion always includes visits to two of the Bridges' children, Sister Miriam Therese of Jesus, a cloistered Carmelite in South Dakota, and Brother Isidore Mary of the Holy Face, a cloistered Carmelite in Wyoming. So basically, we see both of them only once a year. Pat says his children's religious vocations came as no surprise to him and to his family. Actually, I think probably just the opposite. I would have been surprised had they not. Because they, these two seem so set on, you know, that lifestyle and that way of life. And uh, had they not chosen, I'd been surprised. Pat's wife is a cradle Catholic. But Pat converted to the Catholic faith several years after they were married, after the birth of their fifth child. From that point forward, the Catholic faith permeated our lives, basically. Whether it be daily mass, whether it be, you know, frequent confession, whether it be, you know, prayers with the family daily, you know, night prayers. And, you know, even my wife um, homeschooled for a, a, a large portion of these years the kids were being raised. And that gave her the ability to incorporate the liturgical calendar into her daily life. So you celebrate saints' feast days and all those kind of things that, you know, we're able to do. And so really, our kids grew up in a, in a very, very Catholic environment. And although he wasn't blindsided by his children's decisions to pursue religious life, Pat said it was still really, really difficult to say goodbye, especially to his daughter, his oldest child, who was also the first to pursue a religious vocation. You no, know, there's a great deal of grief, actually, uh, when, when, you know, when sister entered, you know, she was the oldest child. The Bridges were living in Texas at the time, but she chose a cloistered Carmelite monastery in South Dakota. It was an 800-mile drive. We drove her up there. And, you know, it's been a cloistered environment. You know, she's not coming back home. And, you know, she, she entered, went through that door, they closed the door behind her. And it's a very, you know, somber moment. And, of course, all her siblings were crying. And then we got in the car and drove, you know, 15 hours back home. Pat said he and his family underwent several months of grieving. You've lost them in a way. You know, you've lost their physical presence. You know, they can't come to their siblings' weddings. You know, those kind of things. You know, they miss all those type of family events. Um, but, you know, you, you, you offset that with the, you know, the joy that they've chosen this lifestyle. That they're committing themselves, you know, to Christ. And that's just, you know, it's, it's, it's bittersweet, I guess. You know, there's you know, some hardships with it, but there's great joy and great, um, you know, it's great spiritual benefits of it all. Brother Isidore is the fifth oldest Bridges child. He joined a cloistered Carmelite monastery in Wyoming about 10 years after his older sister. Pat said Brother Isidore's departure was a little bit easier on the family, because of their experience with Sister Miriam. Today, the family communicates with Brother Isidore and Sister Miriam through letters. Pat and his wife try to write to their children each month. They can respond. um, It kind of depends on the time of year, you know, obviously not during during Lent, things like that. You know, they're a little more limited from their response side. Uh, There is an occasional phone call, but it's typically like for, you know, Father's Day or Mother's Day from, from a wife or a birthday or something like that. Uh, it's, it's not just, uh, you can't just put the phone and call them just to chat. Sister Miriam is now 41. She has been in the Carmelite Monastery for 22 years. I asked Pat if it seemed to him like his daughter has changed a lot since entering. He said it's actually the opposite. It's almost like this time warp. When you go see her, she looks, you know, 
like we actually did the day she first entered. They don't seem to age too much, I guess. Of course, all you see is her, her is her face, you know, because they're they're you know in a full habit. Um, but you know, she's obviously matured in her faith, you know, for sure over that period of time. But she's still the same person she was when she was at home. You know, she's still you know um, you know, has the same sense of humor and all that. And, you know, so she hasn't changed from that regard. Her her personality is the same. Uh, it's just that the depth of her of her faith is is much much greater. Pat said he was surprised by the reaction from some within his Catholic community when his daughter entered the monastery. One comment we got uh, quite often, especially with Sister when she first entered, is fellow Catholics who would make a comment like, well, I couldn't imagine letting my child do that. And it's like, at the same time, you know, we're bemoaning the, the lack of vocations in the church, but not my child, you know. And... Um, I think I'd encourage people to be as open as possible to that because so many, you read so many stories about it. We know, you know seminarians here in Denver who, you know, are in the seminary kind of against the will of their parents. You know, the parents don't want to lose them to the you know, religious life. And um, you have to be supportive of these things. This is what God is calling them to do. And the last thing we we'll do is stand in the way. He said he and his wife were intentional in fostering their children's growth in the faith. One major decision they made was to homeschool their children. Before my, my daughter entered the, the monastery, and she gave a, a talk at our parish, kind of a going away type thing, you know, and she made the comment that um, she felt that had we not homeschooled her, she probably would have lost her vocation. And it wasn't, we weren't raising our kids in order for them to become priests and nuns. That wasn't our goal in life. Our, we we're raising our kids to be good Catholics in whatever you know, life they chose in the future. Pat said all nine of his children are still practicing their Catholic faith. And for that, he's thankful. I just want to encourage people to, you have to live your faith. You have to make it, you know, part of your life. It has to be, you know, kind of every, every pore of your body. And also I would encourage, especially fathers, because so often you see where, you know, mom takes the kids to church or mom prays with the kids and dad does not. And I would definitely encourage the fathers to be, you know, to be fully supportive and show, you know, their Catholic faith to their kids also. I think kids see that a lot in the dads. For CNA Newsroom, I'm Kate Oliveira. CNA Newsroom is a production of Catholic News Agency, a service of EWTN News. I'm your host, Jonah McKeown. I produce and edit this show with the help of our executive producer, Kate Oliveira. A very special thanks to Maureen Breslin and Pat Bridges for taking the time to talk with us. We hope you found their stories encouraging. If you're a fan of CNA Newsroom, please subscribe and leave us a rating and a review. That will help new listeners find our podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next week.